Hi again, and welcome to our video on these methods called linear regression. So regression is actually a whole bunch of different methods. For this video, we're going to focus just on the basic version called ordinary least squares regression, although I will mention a few other techniques as we go without getting into a lot of detail about them. So in this video, I'll explain when you should use linear regression, what you need to do it, and how to evaluate and interpret the results. So regression and correlation have a lot of similarities and are often kind of mixed up with each other, but they differ in their purpose. So you need to think about why you're doing the analysis to begin with. So we've already covered correlation in a previous video, which you use to test for an association between variables that might be related to each other, but where one doesn't cause the other to change. Now, in contrast, you use regression when you think one variable might actually cause the other one to change. So you need to decide before you do your analysis, what is the variable that is being controlled? This is the dependent or the response variable. And what is the variable that's doing the controlling? This is the independent or sometimes called the predictor variable. Now, you can also use regression if you are just wanting to predict the values. So there's sort of a hypothesis testing and a predictive aspect, which um, we'll talk about uh, as we go. So linear regression tests for how or whether the independent variable, which goes on the x-axis, causes the dependent variable, which goes on the y-axis, to change. So to do linear regression, both of the variables that you have are normally measured on a continuous scale. Now, this is a strict requirement for the dependent variable on the y-axis, and it's usually the case for the independent variable, but that's not a requirement, and you can actually do linear regression if you have categorical independent variables, for example. So how is this relationship between the variables determined? Well, and intuitively, if you want to determine the best relationship to draw a best fit line, we're going to draw a line that, maxim that minimizes the distance between the line and all the points. So, okay, well, let's see how that's done. So if we're doing linear regression and fitting a best fit line to this group of points, we can define it by this equation here. Right. The y-coordinate can be described as the equation of a line, where beta 0 is the intercept and beta 1 is the slope. Now, of course, not all lines in real data are going to fall exactly along this predicted line because of random chance and also possibly because there are other controlling factors that we're not including here. Um, so there's another term called the residual, this epsilon here, and that measures the distance between the regression line and the point itself. So residuals are very important. We'll see them a bunch. Okay, so this method is called ordinary least squares regression because this line is determined by minimizing the sum of squares of those residuals in the y direction. So remember that x is our independent variable, so we treat it as a known. We treat each x point as known and we assume it has no error or at least that the error in the x direction is much, much smaller than it is in, in the y direction for our dependent variables. Okay, so I won't go into the math behind it, but the slope of our regression line, which is beta 1, is just the covariance of x and y, so that's the, 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 denom the numerator of our equation here, divided by the variance of the independent variable x. And so you heard about covariance in, in the video on correlation before. So you want to refer back to that. So also, almost all, so all regression lines go through the mean of both variables, right? This is, a, this is the definition of, of how they work. So we can just get the intercept once we know the slope by taking this formula here. Right, so I won't talk about this, but very briefly, I mentioned that we should have no or very small errors in the independent variable. What if you do have error in the independent variable? Well, in that case, you might want to look into methods that are called model two regression methods, or there's one that's sometimes called York regression, and I won't talk about these in this video, so you can look them up if, if this is your situation. So with linear regression, our goal is often to, to determine if there is a significant relationship, that is, where the slope differs significantly from zero. So our null hypothesis is that the variable y is independent of variable x, that is, the slope is zero. However, right, as with all tests, because our two variables are random smaller samples from a larger population, 
we'd expect to find some slope, right? That it might be a little bit different from zero just because of that randomness. But as always, the question is, how much can we let the slope differ from zero before we think it's too unlikely for it to be just two random samples? And then we might conclude that there is a significant relationship. So I'm not gonna go into the mathematical proof behind this, but basically the test statistic is a T statistic. It's calculated as di by dividing the slope, beta one, divided by the standard error of that, that estimate, right? So that gives you a T statistic that follows a T distribution. So we can get a, a P value from this, right? So the P value is the probability of finding a slope at least as extreme as the one that we did find if the null hypothesis was true, right? So if, basically, if we think that the T statistic is too far away from zero, if our slope is too different from zero, we might conclude that it's pretty unlikely, it's too unlikely to have observed that outcome if our null hypothesis was true. But our null hypothesis it should be zero, it could be a little bit different from zero just because of random noise, but if it's too different from zero, we're gonna say, mm, this is not likely enough, this is pretty unlikely, so we can decide to reject the null hypothesis. Right. And so as always, this is tr sort of traditionally done if our p-value is less than 0 0.05. All right, so there are a, a number of assumptions or requirements that we have to do for hypothesis testing in linear regression. And they have to do with the residuals, these residuals. Basically, the residuals, which remember, are in the, in the y-axis direction, the distance between each point and the, the fitted value on the line. So the residuals must be normally distributed around our best fit line, they must, that normal distribution must have sort of equal variance all along the range. Um, and there shouldn't be what's called serial correlation with nearby residuals, which you'll see in a second what that means. All right, so here's, a, here's an example. This is a problem, right? We have a nonlinear relationship. And you might guess this is a problem. We're doing linear regression. So it's probably obvious that fitting a line, a straight line, to a nonlinear relationship is bad. But in this case, you know, one of the reasons it's bad is because the residuals aren't normally distributed. Right? If you look at the very small x values, they're almost all above the line. Right? And if you look at sort of midi middle, the middle of the x-axis, they're almost all below the line. So a very skewed distribution of residuals. And again, they're almost all above the line at, at high values of x. Right? So that's, that doesn't meet our assumptions here, but a normal distribution of residuals at all fitted values. So what could we do? Well, we could transform the data to make it more linear, to make it fit the things better, or there are sort of nonlinear regression methods. All right, well, here's an example of unequal variance, right? So the residuals are much closer to the line at small x values, and they're much more spread out at, at large x values. And this maybe, be, maybe doesn't affect the slope that much, but it does affect how we calculate the p-value and therefore do the sort of hypothesis testing. So if you have this problem, you can use a method called weighted least squares regression. You can look into that yourself. Um, and so finally, here's an example of what, what I mentioned is serial correlation, right? You can basically see that the residuals tend to fluctuate from being above the line to being below to above to below. And, and therefore, you know, if one point is either above the line or below the line, its neighbors tend to be as well. Right, so this usually happens when you're dealing with time series data. So you should be really careful, beware, if you have observations made at multiple points through time. So what do you do if you have this? Well, you can use something called generalized least squares, um, or you can use what are called first differences instead of the raw data. There are, there are videos and exercises towards the end of this course on, on this topic. All right, so you notice that the residual, the assumptions that we had were pretty much all about the residuals and not about the raw data itself. And you can often identify, you can often identify the problems by looking at the raw data, right? But but there are other tools you can use to check the assumptions. Other things called re regression diagnostic plots. So one important one that you can do is you can plot the residuals against the fitted values. And just the fitted values are the expected values of the dependent variable that you calculate from the model, which is basically like where it would plot along the regression line. So the residual points should be normally distributed right, around a mean of zero for all fitted values. So basically, the red line, which is the mean, should be flat and at zero, and the point should be spread around zero, you know, sort of to an equal degree across the whole range there. So this one looks like it's pretty good. The next plot that you can look at is just a QQ plot of the residuals. So this tells you whether the residuals overall are normally distributed. 
you know, generally, if, if it passes the first plot, the residuals versus fitted, it'll pass this one as, as well. Another sort of useful plot is something called the scale location plot. And it just plots the square root of something called the standardized residuals against the fitted values again. Now, this is more or less just a different way of looking at the information from the first plot. But rather than having to look at sort of the spread of points on either side of the of the zero line, um, you you get them sort of plotted just as as sort of all made into positive values here. Um, so here again, we're looking for the red line to be flat, and for the the dots to be kind of equally spread. You shouldn't have like high peaks and low valleys of of the dots, you know, across across the range again here. So again, this one looks pretty fine. Note that the variables themselves don't need to be normally distributed as long as the relationship is, is linear and the residuals meet the assumptions. However, your know, skewed data will have outlier points and it's possible, not, not always, but it's possible for those points to strongly influence the slope of the regression line. That influence, how much it changes the slope just from that one point is called leverage. And you can see it in a fourth diagnostic plot here, which is called residuals versus leverage. So if there are points that have large values of what are called Cook's distance, which are these little curved dotted lines, um, those values are problematic. They have a lot of, they have sort of a lot of leverage, you know, relative to, and, and they have, a, they're also sort of outlier residual points. And so if you have these high leverage and outlier points with large Cook's distance, you might be able to fix the problem by doing a data transformation, which we'll cover later on. If not, then you'll have to think about like, well, what are these, outlier points mean and have to sort of reevaluate things. But generally speaking, it's helpful to have your points spread kind of fairly equally across the range, not to have them all bunched up at one side with only a few on the other side. So, you know, you, if you do have highly skewed data, you know, it might be a good idea to do a data transformation anyway, just to kind of spread the points out. It's not necessary, but it could be helpful. So hypothesis testing and the p-value help you decide how confident to be about the existence of a relationship, right? But it doesn't tell you about the strength of that relationship. It just tells you, does, you know, is it likely to exist or not? So, right, a statistically significant relationship isn't very helpful or meaningful if the predictive power of that relationship is tiny. So that's where something called the coefficient of determination, or r squared, comes into play. Right, you may also care about prediction just on its own. You may not care about the slope or whether the slope differs from zero, but just can you predict values from the other? That is also may, may be your goal to begin with. Right, so the R squared value is calculated as the ratio of the sum of squares of the dependent variable that can be explained by the independent variable divided by the total sum of squares of the dependent variable. Now, that's kind of a long definition. It's often described or talked about as the proportion of variation explained by the independent variable. So basically the panels at the bottom there show a range from a very strong relationship, an R squared of 0.84, or 84% of the variation in the dependent variable can be explained just by knowing the independent variable, to basically no relationship, an R squared of, zero, of, of 0.03, or 3% of the variation is explained. So R squared is, is, you know, in fact, the square of the correlation coefficient R. You know, if you square R, little r, you get capital R squared. But you should be careful to report R, the correlation coefficient, if you're doing correlation, and R squared if you're doing regression. You don't want to mix those two up. All right, so when reporting the results of linear regression, you know, you might want to include a scatter plot showing the data and the, the sort of best fit regression line if you want to visually show your results. It's often helpful to describe the, the relationship in, in words, or at least give the numerical coefficient for, for the effect of that independent variable. And you definitely should give an R squared value, the coefficient determination, which tells you what sort of how strong the relationship is, and the p-value if you're doing hypothesis testing to tell us about sort of how confident we are that there is a relationship. All right, so in, in R, the function for linear regression is called LM. That stands for linear model. You can use multiple independent variables, which we'll get to in a later video, but for now, we're just doing single um, regression, simple linear regression. So the syntax is similar to ANOVA, where you use this function where LM and you have the dependent variable 
as a function of the independent variable using this little tilde symbol. Right, remember that the dependent variable is the one on the y-axis and the independent variable is the one on the x-axis. So in R, you get a lot of output with this. A lot of these items, however, are more applicable for multiple regression, which we're not discussing right now. So what you get is you get, well, first you get the, the formula you put in, but then you get sort of some statistics about the distribution of the residuals. And this is a useful kind of first point for checking the assumptions, right? You know, you'd expect the residual should be fairly symmetrical, right? With a median of about zero. You can see that here, the min and the max are about opposite in the first and the third quartile, about opposite again. But you really, you should use the residual diagnostic, the regression diagnostic plots in this case to, to look to, at the assumptions. All right, the second part is, is kind of the key part, right? This is what gives you information about the coefficients. There is a coefficient for the intercept, and there is, you get it the intercept, you get it standard error, you get it converted to a t-statistic, and you get the p-value for that, which is this pr brackets greater than t thing. Um, you know, we can almost always ignore the intercept because it's just testing if it differs from zero, and that's sort of rarely something we care about, but it might be something you care about, but often the intercept is not important. So we really focus on the other rows, in this case, the second row, which is labeled with the name of the independent variable that you're looking at. So this gives, again, the coefficient. The estimate column is the coefficient, the standard error, the t-statistic, and the p-value. Again, for this, the, the null hypothesis is that the coefficient is zero. So the coefficient that we get, 0.12 and 16, you know, in this case, is always, always tells you how many units the dependent variable will change by for each one unit increase in the independent variable. So both are measured in the actual units of whatever the variable is, right? So your if your coefficient is 0.12, that could mean that your dependent variable goes up by 0.12 pH units, 0.12 degrees Celsius, 0.12%, whatever your units are, right? So in the case of our regression here, this estimates just the slope of the line, basically, and it tells us that, that K2O increases by 0.12 percentage points, because they're measured in percentage points, um, for every one percentage point increase in SiO2. But remember, it'll be for one unit, whatever the units are increase, causes a 0.12 unit, whatever the units are, increase in your dependent variable. All right, so the final part gives you a bunch of different data on sort of how well the model fits the, the data you have. Um, the, there are actually two R squared values here, which is a little confusing. There's the multiple and the adjusted R squared. Um, the adjusted one does some adjustments that are for sort of the number of parameters in a, in a multiple regression, if you have more than one independent variable. But if you're just doing a single independent variable, you should use the multiple R squared coefficient as your R squared. The F statistic was in the bottom line basically just test the significance of sort of the overall model against what you would get if you just had a model with an intercept and a flat line. Again, this is sort of more relevant for multiple regression. In the case of a single regression, the p-value from this will be the same as the p-value for your, your independent variable coefficient. All right, well, that's it for now. Uh, you'll learn more about regression in later exercises, so thanks for listening now.